Okay, we're back. Uh, the live stream is on, as far as I know, already. So what were we discussing? The most common, the most common uh, conditions, most commonly caused by staph aureus. And we said that, actually he said that uh, endocarditis is caused most commonly by uh, bacteria Staphylococcus aureus, golden Staphylococcus. My next question would be, what is endocarditis at all? Um, okay, heart has like three layers, pericarditis, myocard um, sorry. pericardium, myocardium, and endocardium. So endocarditis will be the inflammation of that endocardium. Where is it located? Like somehow explain what are we talking about when I'm when we say endocardium. Okay, thank you. That was very nice. Uh, the inner layer of the heart. What kind of layer is that? What uh, what does it do? It has the direct actual contact with the blood that comes in into the heart chambers, right? So when there is a risky condition, uh, meaning when there is bacteremia, what does it mean? Okay, bacteremia will be a bacteria, presence of bacteria in the blood. Everything that ends with emia from now on, if you didn't know that, will mean something in the blood. Okay? Um, yeah, hyperglycemia. High glucose wear. Okay. Um, septicemia. Okay. That's confusing. Septicemia kind of means the same bacteremia when it actually causes infection. Okay, bacteremia is the condition that bacteria is present in the blood, but it doesn't tell you anything about the symptoms of the patient. It just tells you the bacteria is there. Septicemia means that because of bacteremia, now your patient has fever, has high white blood cell count in the blood, has high CRP, has high respiration rate, and so on and so on. All these major signs of infection is there because of septicemia. Okay, um, let's say bacteria is in the blood. Actually, uh, there are many, right, there is a good chance if you just had lunch, something rough, like, I don't know, the biscuit or something like that, it kind of was rough on your gums, there is a quite high chance that right now you are bacteremic. What does that mean? Exactly. There is a bacteria in our blood frequently, lots of times, flossing, uh, hard brushing the teeth, I don't know, doing some dental manipulations on your teeth, or doing something mostly in the oral cavity that damages the microvessel of our oral mucosa, directly introduces bacteria inside the blood. We become bacteremic, but our immune system clears it immediately without us even knowing it because well, we stay healthy, right? Okay, but some people with risky conditions, it's not the same for everyone, okay? So some patients, when they become bacteremic, the bacteria uh, first kind of circulates in the blood system, and then when it finds the place to attach, it does attach there, it causes infection. One of the major points of attachment will be the heart valve, okay, because it's directly hanging there. Blood comes in into the heart chamber, it kind of bumps into a valve. Agreed? Okay, so that's a very nice area for replication. That's why bacteremia ends with endocarditis for some patients. And Staphylococcus aureus is going to be the leading cause of all the possibilities. 
about 25 to up to 35 percent of cases, all cases of bacterial endocarditis will be caused by Staphylococcus aureus. And please take a look, mortality rate can be as high as, okay, 20 is even high. Like, imagine out of every 100 patients who has endocarditis, 20 will die at least. So that's very high mortality. But, well, it, why am I uh, pressing this? Because it is a very serious life threatening condition. Uh, suspect endocarditis in every patient. Okay, you tell me. Patient comes to you. I will begin with initial symptoms. Uh, it is a 32 year old male, otherwise healthy, no previous heart conditions, uh, comes to you with uh, three days of chills and fevers up to 40 degrees Celsius, um, accompanied by like chills. Uh, and he feels very bad. He feels fatigued, he's not able to walk two meters with a uh, break. No, I'm not even talking about coming up the stairs. He feels very disnake. And when you look at this person, you actually see that he is really ill. The ill appearing, appearing patient is in front of him. Okay? That's all we got. Fever. High fever, an otherwise healthy patient. Uh, sorry. Definitely. Why not? So, all you've got is fever for now, and dyspnea, uh, the fatigue and dyspnea in otherwise healthy patient. Uh, he mentioned flu is not a bad idea actually when we're talking about otherwise healthy patients. Suddenly they develop high fever. Most likely it's some virus, but what are you begin, what do you begin your physical exam with? Uh -huh. So auscultate, listen to the heart, for sure, the lungs, then examine the oral cavity, because you're searching, there is nothing there, it's a fever and can be anything. So physical exam will include um, inspect the oral cavity, the pharynx, palpate for lymphadenopathy, then you go down and listen to the lungs and heart. And that's when, if you are an experienced, uh, let's say, you have an experience listening what is normal, what is sound normally, how does the heart sound, then a very high chance that you will hear something different from normal. And this something different we most commonly call as a murmur. So if there is some kind of uh, wave like sound coming from the heart. Uh, it can be systolic, it can be diastolic, not go there because it's a science. Thing. But sometimes, some experience, house auscultate the murmur in a young, otherwise healthy patient. There is not supposed to be a murmur there in the heart. Okay. Next step, in the lungs, let's imagine the abdominal examination was normal and uh, there, there was no lymphadenopathy. Everything else was normal except that murmur. That's one physical exam for me. And yeah, when you got to the heart, let out the family member, ask about the sexual habit, and then you ask the drug use. They tell you that yes, they use the drugs intravenously. The last time they used it was like four days ago. Um, yeah, and you, when you physically examine the skin, you see the needles. Lots of places. So basically, that's a history suggesting a risk. And what's the next step? What information do we have now? Young male, 
with fever, murmur, IV drug use. What's next? Uh -huh. Diagnostic test. What test you want to order? One. <laughs> okay. CBC, which is complete blood count, which measures you are interested in white blood cells. And nature for count. What else? Uh, okay, but before we get there, tell me the general task that we perform on every patient when you think there is a bacteria. Okay? Blood culture? Yeah, yeah so CBC or F, whatever. Uh, ESR, erythrocyte sedimentation. Uh, marker of inflammation. Third one is C reactive protein. Routinely, you do to every patient whenever you think there is a might be an infection. plus two very important tests that not on this slide, but blood culture was a very very nice idea. You should do it. That's how you make a diagnosis of. Basic. So one second. Uh, you know what? It's uh, clinical. Other than. But the PCR based technology is a most not clinical, commercial. But in research centers, there is. So, uh, tricuspid valvular endocarditis is most commonly seen in IV drug users. And tell me, where is the location of? Right between right, what? right atrium and ventral. Agreed. So, intravenous drug users most tend to develop um, they tend to develop endocarditis in lots of places. But again, statistically speaking, valve is most common, and cephalococcus aureus is the most common cause of that. Toxic clinical appearance, that's what I meant when I said that you look at the patient and they really look ill. Uh, pleuritic chest pain sometimes are accompanied, sometimes bloody, sometimes purulent sputum, and no previous history of cardiac disease before. That's going to be a classic typical patient uh, with tricuspid. We also have left-sided um, These tend to be more common in elderly patients. The patients who have uh, previous problems with their valves, like for example, age-related aortic stenosis. What did I say? The last two words. What does that mean? Aortic valve is has a stenosis. What's stenosis? Yeah. So, briefly talking, as advancing age with advancing age, there are some patients develop calcification of the valve, so that they no longer open properly, so they can they shift and cause a stenosis. Bacteria can attach to it because it's even better. Uh, let's say. Attachment because the valve is already damaged and bacteria tends to accumulate in places where there is a previous ongoing damage of endothelium. Yeah.
um, not only one of the reasons might be that not only uh, it might be because of say bacteria attack the right side of the heart this might lead to some kind of uh, temporary right side failure leading to things but basically acutely failing right uh, heart might cause a pulmonary backup flow of the blood that might lead to this cuff development of this cuff might lead to the, the pleuritic chest pain and also what you said that the bacteria might seed the lungs might purulent again it's not present all the patients, it might be, might be up. My personal experience, most of my Hardly agree, but you should not forget that the valves have the direct contact with the blood. So some level of white blood cells definitely reaches them, but I agree that removal of the bacteria once it gets that is there because of that of us. And when there is a left sided endocarditis, Caused by self -work. patients tend to be old, and prognosis is worse. Now tell me what is prognosis, because in my experience, I see a lot of students do not understand what prognosis So basically, prognosis, is starting from now, when I say prognosis is bad, or prognosis is good, that means that uh, what will happen in the future, so oh, compared to the otherwise healthy IV drug users, these patients have worse prognosis. So their risks of developing uh, complications and the death are higher. Understood? Um, no, age dependent plus the other risks. Because, uh, old saying prognosis is worse partly due to uh, a increasing age and uh, why so because what does the age it's not only about the immune system it means that these patients early patients have a risk of having some other chronic conditions like hypertension diabetes obesity uh, that all together the so it's kind of combined effect um, and they might uh, worse. Additional reason, yeah. Generally speaking, the patients who have left-sided endocarditis tend to be old. And uh, they tend to have a previous effect. All things considered, and that makes their prognosis uh, compared to the previous quite healthy younger patients with right sided endocarditis. What's that device related? What device? 
women. Pacemaker, very good. What else can be inserted inside the human heart? Hmm? Sorry? Pens are in the coronary vessels and uh, very, very surprising. Pens are almost never, nobody knows. Defibrillator, sorry. Uh, yeah, some patients are given pacemakers. And I keep up, these are metal uh, containing things inserted into the heart chamber, and then they uh, give a pace heart. Some patients are given defibrillator, but um, defibrillator heart, so they kind of stop the possible arrhythmia. Thank you. Artificial. Okay. So, yeah. Artificial. Let's summarize. Artificial valves, defibrillators, and pacemakers. And rarely some catheters might be. These all, because they are formed by not only. What else? Now go out. Sorry. Oh, yes. Aortic treatment is a devastating because imagine that someone is given a uh, that needs, uh, I don't know, at least 10 hours. And there are so many things. Gets infected. The only way of healing. Anytime there is a foreign material injected inserted into the body, if you want to cure the problem, what are you gonna? Do? Hmm? Remove it. There is absolutely no of the patient covering unless you remove. Infected and and our prosthesis is uh, very hard, very fast, and prognosis is like survival is like twenty in first year. Very bad condition to get. So. Let's get back to the successful management of that infection means removal of the device. Okay, plus antibiotic, of course, but yeah, you know what antibiotics do? They will just stop the bacteria from being in the blood. They don't. They are not able to enter the the valve or the whatever that is. It. Uh, so remove it. That's the only way. We, ha I have one elderly patient who has uh, infected joint control, Fem femoral head joint. Same principle. Whatever is infected, artificial joint, artificial, the orthopod, they do a lot of nails and all of them might get infected. The only way of curing that is removal. Um, so these orthopedic patients frequently have um, infections. I tell them, please remove that. Orthopad doesn't want to. <laughs> wants me to treat the infection without removing it. That's not possible. The only way of doing it Giving patients lifelong antibiotics, just like the antihypertension. So that's the principle. Okay, starting from now on, please know that 
whenever there is, okay, urinary catheters, sometimes they get infected, change them, place the new one. Here is the diagnostic to people who have bacteremia and endocarditis. A best initial test, sorry, the red is not very well visible in this uh, screen. Best initial test is going to be a blood pressure. And then you're going to do an echocardiography, which is a cardiac ultrasound. We mentioned that yesterday, you remember? Basically, there are two types of echo when we're talking about endocarditis. Sorry. Echo plus blood count. Two things you are doing. One, you are searching what is the exact cause. How are you going to do that? With the help of blood culture. So you are taking a blood and growing a bacteria out of it. That's going to be about 90, 95, 99% sensitive. In the hospital that I work, always sterile. Like what they do to this blood. It never grows anything. So, what does that mean? That we are we do know there is an endocarditis, but we have no idea what's the cause. So, what are we doing? How do you think? How are we treating them? You know, antibiotics are we using? Road spec. Yes, there's no idea what it might be. You just know the statistics that most likely it is Staphylococcus aureus, but, well, when we are dealing with life-threatening conditions, you cannot rely on most likely. That's why we are taking um, broad-spectrum, wide-spectrum antibiotics to the patient. And second, very helpful diagnostic test, is going to be a cardiac echo. But that's a left ventricle. That's a left atrium. There is a mitral. That's a right atrium. That's a right ventricle. Here is a tricuspid valve. And that, the, take a look at valve here. It's kind of smooth. And take a look at valve here. And that is the vegetation. Vegetation is a collection of bacteria, of platelets, of five blood cells together, growing in this kind of masses that actually can follow and that cluster because it follows the bloodstream and sees the organs, and all the organs are infected. With that. So basically, we don't want to this. Okay? So that is. Um, Tricuspid valve vegetation. So you are you did you did culture of blood and you also did an echo to find out what is the exact location of the um, infection. In our case, it's on the tricuspid. Then in about five minutes, of your blood culture results will tell you what kind of bacteria is causing this. Okay. Do you have any questions? How we approach the patient with a possible endocarditis. Yeah, we have a major criteria uh, based on top blood cultures and uh, visual valvular vegetations and ultrasound. And we have a minor culture of fever, predisposing lesion, uh, the risky behavior, meaning IV use, Embolic phenomena and immunologic phenomena that I'll just skip for now in infectious diseases when you come back, we're going to have a whole chapter dedicated to that. Um, and well, definite endocarditis is, will be both of those major criteria or one major plus three minor and just five minor. 
Um. Questions about that? Before we have a break? Okay then, break, 10 minutes.
Okay. Let's begin. I mean, continue our discussion. That's the last bit in this presentation about cephalosis. The first portion of uh, our lecture was dedicated to Staphylococcus aureus infection. Done that. We finished that. So now here you see uh, coagulase negative Staphylococcus. There are lots. So catalase positive, coagulase positive was just one, Staphylococcus aureus. We kind of talked about the major things with it. Now we are in the other group. Still the Staphylococcus, but they have an enzyme that turns fibrin into fibrinogen. Thus, um, that, that makes them is negative. Uh, here we have two of them only discussed. There are like two sentences about the staph Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Uh, and it's what you need to know about it is that Staph saprophyticus is going to be a second most common of UTI infections in young women. Very specific. Not even in everyone. Only in young women of childbearing age. Uh, quick question. Maybe you know what's the most common cause of urinary tract infections. In all ages, all risk factors, everyone. No. No problem. You have not yet learned that. You might have microbiome. Yeah. Okay. E. coli shortly. And... Uh, Full name is Escherichia coli, okay. gram negative bacilli living in our gut, everybody's gut, sometimes and very commonly causes urinary tract infections uh, in everyone, children, young people, males, females, catheterized, whatever, everyone have E. coli. Second most common in the young women, it's going to be stuff. That's all you need to know about stuff. Okay. We've got Staphylococcus epidermitis, and I want you to guess where it lives. Yeah. See, it lives on our skin, everybody's skin the most abundant bacteria uh, on everybody. You will not get rid of it. Don't even try. Uh, I've seen a meme. It said, when you feel lonely, think about all the bacteria living on you, in you, so you'll never feel lonely. Basically, staph epidermitis is one of our most common, I mean, uh, most abundant, normal and the concentration of these bacteria is highest in orifice in vagina. And the staphylococcus is harmless on the skin. Okay, it's supposed to be there when it leaves on the skin. But when we, we do care about it a lot, because whenever it gets inside the blood, because that's when the problems begin. Um, Staphylococcus epidermitis is the most common cause of prosthetic device infection. What prosthetic devices we kind of mentioned before the break? What are the most common prosthetic devices? Pacemakers, defibrillators. Sorry? Catheters, any kind of venous catheters, maybe a jugular vein catheter, can be some intra arterial catheter, urinary catheter, uh, what else? Uh, joints, orthopedic uh, implants, all types. Anything that does not belong to your body is inserted 
into it and left of the base is a risk of getting infected by the skin flora. It has skin, gets contaminated by the skin flora, and the stuff epidermitis has ability. One second, let me turn the light. Show you what it is. Crazy. So basically, you even see not imagine that's a needle. Okay, that's a needle surface contaminated by. So in the beginning, there is a few of them there. They have ability to called uh, biofilm. Biofilm is a glycoprotein. What does it mean? That the white blood cells, the antibiotics, not be able to penetrate. The protective layer, synthesize the protective layer for themselves. And then they grow there inside of it safely. And this biofilm will uh, make sure that this is firmly. Some orthopeds uh, don't want to, you know what they do? I mean, what has been tried before. For example, someone has infected a prosthetic joint, which costs a lot, thousands of dollars, for example. And, uh, well, the patient does not want to spend more money. The orthopads are trying to treat this prosthesis. Let's imagine that that's an um, uh, artificial joint. So they take it out from the body, and then they wash it with some chemicals, with disinfection and uh, sterilization and stuff. But it has not worked. It still has high rates of reinfection. So we general the general recommendation is that do not wash reinstall the joint back. Just replace, use the new one. Okay, because it works like a molecular level glue that sticks the body on very firmly, and even one of them survives after all the sterilization procedures, they will. Will be released from the uh, biofilm. So again, the only only guaranteed way of is removal and replacement. And by the way, there is also ten percent risk of that point new one also getting infected. And imagine yourselves telling this to your patient in advance. <laughs> Some of them just run away. They don't want anything from Uh no. It's uh mostly it's United States. Georgian statistics uh I'm not aware of them if they exist. When you've got patient with uh, this infection, let's say, okay, let's take the simple case, valve infection, endocarditis. Someone has been given an artificial valve, and then they develop aesthetic valvular endocarditis. So that valve that you inserted got infected by the bacteria. Mm. Basically, you want to know like the approach is the same. You do two things. What are those two things? Diagnostic testing. What diagnostic tests they do? The diagnosis of endocarditis. Black culture and cardiac echo. Okay, you do two, these two same for the same. 
you did a cardiac echo, you see the how now you want to know is what, which bacteria is because I'm telling you that stuff epidermitis is the most common statistically speaking. But when we're dealing with the actual patient, you cannot rely on most common. You need to know for sure, or at least you should try to know for sure. That's why you do a blood culture. So where are you taking the blood? of blood draw. I'm not sure. I just made up what I said. But basically, where are you drawing the blood? Which veins? Doesn't matter. Name of it. Tomorrow is supposed to be down there. Antecubital fossa. Name of the. Either from the medial and mm -hmm. median anterior cutaneous. No, it's the vein. Is that the vein? Does it mean median cubital vein is just joining of two veins? Okay. Yeah, but mm, it's often used. Okay, so basically. Imagine that you drew the, or the nurse drew the blood from there. Okay? Doing something. Also, the needle first touches the skin, right? What it leaves on the skin? Normally, leaves on everybody's skin. So you and send it to culture, and it grew staphylococcus uh, epidermitis, and you are not sure. Is this normal flora contaminating your blood sample, or is this the actual bacteria causing endocarditis? Do you follow me? OK. How can we, let's say, set this answer? Is this a contamination of a blood sample, or is this the bacteria causing the infection? Okay. Uh, measures to minimize this contaminating risk is drawing the blood from several veins simultaneously, at least two. And then down, why are we doing it? Because if all of these samples of blood alter the same bacteria that with the same anti antibiotic and it increases the truthfulness of this test. Yes. We take in the hospital that I work and in the other places like where we take from two to normally it yes. 
Not entirely sure, but if I'll tell, give you an example. If you did these two samples, send it to Kaspar, one of them to Staphylococcus aureus, and another one to Staphylococcus epidermidis, that's a confusion. Either is a contamination, but you don't know which one. In that case, you either have to do a uh, recalculate. That happens that things culture different bacteria, most likely one of them is contamination and one of them is the in real life that actually if the lab is not good enough and if not the Okay, now the treatment stuff begins that I will up and continue with because it's in the you are not you don't have to the in the ground positive cocci. So they stain positively with some stain and they are if they were catalase positive, so they did possess an enzyme catalase, we identified them immediately in the gene the staphylococci, and we were going to catalase negative. Both the gram positive organisms, globulins, do not possess an enzyme catalase, they immediately are classified as streptococci. And then they are further subdivided in huge amount of separate organisms. And the first step of is their ability to hemolyze the blood. Hemolyze, what does I mean? Uh -huh, destruction of the red blood. There are three types of hemolysis patterns, beta, complete. Alpha partial destruction, and then there is gamma, which is no destruction of the red at all. Good. So, you see the pattern here in the middle, the steps different were applied. The red blood cells are hemolyzed. That complete hemolysis, also known as beta. You can see how it happens in partial hemolysis. A little bit of the where the streptococci were at one time. I don't know how to say that. No, that's what we call a gamma. Okay. Now these. Specifically, will be Streptococcus pneumonia. Let's follow the So, based on hemolysis, we go here in alpha hemolysis type, and then we go this way. Optogen is an older, too toxic for humans antibiotic. We no longer use it. But use it. Optogen sensitive. So antibiotic. Encapsulate that the different new thing that ha I have not seen before. Capsule very important for survival of these organisms. Uh, it's additional weapon. Okay. Pneumonia is also known as pneumococcus. And we mentioned gram positive, alpha hemolytic, aerobic, encapsulated diplococci, meaning that they are like a couple always. Yeah, there are two of them. Each is covered with a capsule, two of them. 
and it commonly colonizes human respiratory tract in winter and spring, and it's spread by the airborne droplet. You see, sneezing, coughing, talking, uh, I don't know, speeding, all produce these droplets. Disease. This slide, I want to know very well. Six years after, when you graduate, or <laughs> you graduate sooner, even after you graduate, you can remember this. So, disease is most commonly caused by as pneumonia, are going to be out for of a middle ear, sinusitis, pneumonia, and meningitis. We're going to discuss this. Don't think we're going to handle it today, but next Thursday. Clearly, it can cause endocarditis, septicitis, and peritonitis, which is severe. Any questions regarding this? Important weapon, additional thing here. Is. Do you see the button? No, you don't. Okay. So the dark blue part, that's the thing. And do you see? These are the capsule antigens. Different antigens are sticking out of the capsule. Please imagine capsule as being an invisibility cloak for the bacteria. Because uh, encapsulated organism, because there are some. Um, one second. Some of the pneumococcus do not have a capsule, and they do not. Um, presence of contributes to virulence and pathogenicity. So, presence of capsule defines uh, and the population who are under increased risk of developing infections, pneumo. Are going to be elderly patients, example, liver failures, anything that is chronic and requires chronic management. If these patients develop a pneumococcal infection, their prognosis is worse compared to the younger non chronically infected patients. So no matter which field of medicine you choose, even in family medicine, when the elderly patient comes to you, always advise them to vaccinate for the okay? it really, really improve their survival. Um, patients without clean, doesn't matter what's the reason why they have no skin. Is it because the and stopped working because of some problem? Was there a surgery? Was there a traumatic rupture? And then it doesn't matter. If there is no spleen, patients have uh, serious problems with encapsulated bacteria. Not only this one, but all of them. Um, sick cell disease patients included here, because they are considered as uh, patients with cochlear implants, with hearing aids, patients with traumatic CSF leak, like head trauma leak, CSF leak, they are smokers, they have of their makes it easier So, about the capsule. 
as I said, capsule is like an invisibility cloak for the bacteria, make them more like invisible for the recognition by the microbes. So, the neutrophils, the phagocytes, all of them not able to see encapsulated areas as effective as the other ones. So they think that, well, it's something of our own, and then they can ignore it. And that's the Lord of the Rings meme. If you know the movie, you will understand it. But the encapsulated bacteria generally are neutral in the spleen. Because in the spleen, we've got a huge amount of phagocytes residing there. There is a um, high amount of phagocytosis taking place there. So this area most are removed. If there is no spleen, the risk of uh, serious conditions increases, followed by uh, including strep, acute otitis media. Okay, do you know about it? Oh no. Uh, tell me about the patient. I'll tell you the age. Five-year-old, no. Three-year-old is brought to you. You should eventually make a diagnosis of a type. You describe the symptom that this child will have. Some of them is. The child is brought to you. Year old. What does the mother have? Mm -hmm. So the baby is irritable, cries a lot. What else? Mm -hmm. Otitis media, middle ear infection. How do you know that? You don't know why. Maybe might not be able to. When we're talking about children, history taking is hard because they most of them don't. And plus, there is additional pressure that parents that want their and let you do things in test scope. Generally, test my step. Dealing with makes me cry too. So I tend to not. Uh, so the child is irritated a lot, has a fever mostly. Sometimes it will have it as additional binary, which means nasal discharge. Also, doesn't eat much, doesn't drink much, uh, throat, throat. And then, if they are able to tell you, or if they are cold, they will tell you that my ear hurts, but most of the times they won't. Well, half of the times they just won't be able to tell you that. Then, what are you doing? Physical approach. Mm. So, what do we call it? Yeah. My husband is pediatrician. Super huge man. Regular thing. But, well, he adores it. Uh, but basically, yeah, the cooler your otoscope is. Uh, so basically, otoscope is a good tool if you're a pediatrician. What are you doing with that? What does it look like? With that? Do you know what the otoscope looks like? Okay, what does it do?
I don't hear you. Come on. Okay, so you are taking this otoscope that has the lights and stuff and shine the light into the patient's what wait. Oh, medical term. Okay, so external auditory channel. That's and what are you trying to visualize? That axis. And the infection is in middle. So external ear. External ear is here. That's a tympanic membrane. And that's where the infection is taking. So, how is otoscopy helpful? You are here. Huh? Pass, pass to be here. You've got a membrane. Oh, sorry, what? Okay, how, what would you see? Exactly. One of the signs of inflammation. Oh, okay. Remember the four signs of inflammation? Gonna be four. One of them would be edema. The fluid and fluid accumulating inside is going to push the uh, tympanic membrane. What else is going to happen? What will the tympanic membrane look? Semi, a semi-transparent membrane, and you are able to see the shadow of the skeletal bones beyond. And you know the otoscope. That's absolutely normal. This takes a look when it's inflamed, it's bulging, it's red. Red, it's bulging, and it's swollen, right? So if you see this, that's the diagnosis of what? Question. Okay, what do you do next? Culture. You wanna do? Oh, you are, <laughs> you are like the torture. <laughs> Already crying, baby. You clearly are able to look into the tympanic membrane. And now, okay, do you want to stick a large needle here inside the tympanic membrane and then aspirate some fluid and then send the fluid to culture? <laughs> Generally speaking, it's not a bad idea, but <laughs> okay. generally speaking, that's your last Don't do it immediately. Don't do it. Starting from here, you've got your diagnosis, acute otitis media, and my advice, the guidelines advice, which is just give antibiotics, because the most common possible bacteria all are covered with the same antibiotics. It's uh, also not very white. Yes, or amoxic uh, plus mutation. So these are the things. You can start remembering right away. So, streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of what I just Second most common cause is going to be Haemophilus influenza. Anything to do with the virus. And then we've got Muraxella cassavax. Three most common bacteria causing childhood otitis media. No idea if you want to 
meaning. Remember that you told that you give antibiotics, take a needle, okay? Sinusitis. You know what the sinuses are? I think you do, right? Same most common cause. Third one, Moraxella cassara. Same. And it's very common for them. Same causes. Okay, I'm going to show you this. Okay, I'm going to describe generally because I need you to one out. You haven't noticed. Which eyes and which eyes? Okay, these are eyes. Okay, normally what is supposed to be in the sinus? What does it do? The sinuses. They are hollow spaces, right? Hollow spaces filled with air. That's what we need. So one of the sinus is filled with air. Here, one of the sinus is filled with inflammatory material. And I want you to tell me first, identify the side. Which one is the left? Which one is the right, please? Come on, you killed everything. Yeah, basically, um, that's going to be that's gonna be the left side of the patient. Okay. Uh, so where do we have a problem? On the right. Sorry, give me the medical uh, term for this. Oh. Thank you. So we're talking about the max. This is the nose. Uh, and the max looks abnormal to you. Right side or the left side? Explain, please. Yes, generally speaking, the wider it is on the CT scan, the more solid it is. Okay? So bones are most solid. And hollow space that is normally filled with air is supposed to look dark. Okay? Yes, so the right side of the maxillary sinus is not that hollow anymore which has the uh, same density as the muscle, right? So it's something denser, something maybe, some inflammation maybe, I don't know, I cannot exactly. It is something happening. Is it totally normal? Oh, sorry, left. Is it totally normal? Not really. Some part of a field with inflammatory matter. Okay? All right, so you've got a 23-year-old girl with the, the history. Okay. Uh, why? Okay. Let's say antibiotics. So amoxicillin or amoxicillin. In any case, why? Why not 
Walker. Good idea. You just assume that some of those, one of those three most common ones, but why don't you culture? And if you do, what do you culture? Of what? Okay, the fluid of the right maxillary sinus. Where are you going to obtain that? How are you going to obtain that? There are several methods. All of them are super invasive. Okay? So it's better. Just start treatment with antibiotics with the following colony cases, okay? Because, well, it's going to be any of those things. Agreed? All right. Okay. I need we've got five minutes. Uh, we've got six-year-old uh, male. It doesn't have a okay. traumatic 20 years ago. Uh, comes to you with fever of that has been dry now worse. Now it has um peeled from the sputum and the sputum has yellowish sometimes greenish. Examine. Pulmonary auscultation. exam will include auscultation of the heart and lungs, and lung auscultation shows you what? Crackle. Do you know what the crackle sound like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like people who have long enough hair, you take your hair. And the uh, rabbit. If you don't, just Google it. Really, uh, sound like Sometimes compare it to walking into the snow. It sound. There are some people that do not have hair long enough, neither they. The crackles sound. Is characteristic of pneumonia. Okay. There is an, inf an inflammation taking place inside the lung, one place of the lung, one lobe of the lung, or like that. What's the most common bacterial cause of that? Okay. Thank you. Streptococcus pneumonia is the most common cause of. Virus. Rust. Next step, you also take the calls. Uh, my advice will be never trust your own ears. Possible to um, do.
do an additional diagnostic test, always do it. I see a lot of patients coming to doctors, um, doctors consultating, telling them, no, you're okay, you don't have anything. Letting them go while they ask. But doctors are not asking. They always do a diagnostic test. do a diagnostic And very good treatment of pneumonia. Blood work. Suspected pneumonia case. CBC, ESR, CRP, thank you. Uh, my advisory also ordered creatinine and la, uh, liver functions. It's not for insulin, it's just your future planning ahead which antibiotic to give. Creatinine is high, you cannot give a nephrotoxic. Ones, give the liver you cannot give but the toxic ones and what's the radiologic test mm -hmm. no brilliant test simple easy uh, widely available everywhere and this is the typical Tell me of what side. Ribs. That's a heart. It's supposed to be like that. And heart shadow goes on the left. Okay, unless they have sinus And. Something has become more solid in the lungs that normally are uh, air filled cavities. It's supposed to be. And that's the same patient from the side. You can see the whole lobe is more solid. Why is it more solid? Because the white blood cells, the bacteria, the inflammatory material, and uh, what else is the fluid and everything made it more solid. Appearing it whitish on X. That's a CT scan. Of course, CT scan is better, visualizes better. Everything is in more detailed, more details, but well, um, not always needed because it costs a lot. Now, there are some. About the radiation, yeah, whenever do an X. So, left side. Okay, this right or is it left? Okay, it is. I cannot like this. <laughs> That's a heart. Deep. Not very well visible. Here are the vertebra. You are looking at the patient from the shoe. That's why this is the right side, this is the left side. And you can see the consolidation classified into as low bird. Finish now. Continue with meningitis on the Thursday. And uh, then, if I am able to do everything that I have planned, we're going to have a quick take. See you on Friday. I'm not sure yet. 